As a mental health advocate and author, I love books. Books have the capacity to inspire, educate, transform, and ultimately help readers all over the world. So if you want to publish your book or if you need help writing your story, I highly recommend Mindstir Media, rated the number one best book publisher around the country. Mindstir Media can help you no matter where you are in the book writing or publishing process. Go to mindstermedia.com to learn more and schedule a consultation. Out Comes the Sun with Mariel Hemingway and Melissa Yamaguchi. Out Comes the Sun compassionately helps you navigate mental wellness practices that you can apply to your daily life. And we tell your story. And now, Mariel Hemingway and Melissa Yamaguchi. Welcome, everybody, to Out Comes the Sun Radio with my host, Melissa Yamaguchi, and myself, Mariel Hemingway. I I have no words today for how excited I am because we have an amazing guest who, whom I actually know, but I haven't seen or heard from in 30 some years. Anyway, being right along from that, first, we're going to have a little chat because that's what we do. And we're going to talk about homelessness because it's a serious, serious issue, especially if you're here in Southern California, which I am right now. I'm not in Idaho. I'm in, I'm actually in Venice and Venice still continues to have a very serious problem with homeless. And at first we, you know, I I guess people of, you know, that have homes and that are privileged enough, privileged enough to have homes, you sort of, you're just, you're irritated by it. You think, oh my God, this is so, you know, they're messy, they're dirty, they yell, they don't pick up the trash, they leave it on the ground. And and it's really hard as a, a member of, uh, of a neighborhood that's really suffering under this um, thing called homelessness, to have compassion. And yet I really want to find my compassion because I realize, you know, most of these people are suffering from mental illness, right? Mm-hmm. There's a mental illness problem, whether it's serious addiction or it's just, you know, things have fallen apart. And then there are the few that that are just, you know, they've come, come up against very, very hard times. There's a woman across the street who bought this motor home that's been sitting out in front of our building for 18 months. And she just bought it and she's trying to renovate it. She's homeless herself, but she bought it for like a hundred dollars or something. She somehow got the money. And so every day is this journey of her trying to fix it up. So I I applaud her because she's trying so hard to, to, you know, make a difference in her little world. And I'm trying to find compassion for, you know, the mess that I wake up to almost every morning. And instead of getting upset, which I did for a couple, (laughs) for a couple of weeks, I've now decided I just go down in the morning. I take, I put rubber gloves on and I pick up the trash and I put it away. And as I've been doing that, it's kind of like show by example. I think a lot of these homeless have kind of seen me. And so they're being a little bit better on the street because I'm doing that. I'm participating. I'm not yelling at them. I I never would yell at them anyway, but you know, it's a big issue. So I'm sure you have, have, you know, thoughts on this. Well, I'm, um, regardless of one's plight in life, excuse me, regardless of one's stature, Everyone responds to kindness and, you know, it makes me think of the old um, phrase there, but for the grace of God go I, and we, when, when funding was, was cut from a lot of our mental health institutions and people were then really set free on the street with no means of understanding how to take care of themselves. 
And for whatever reason, uh, job layoffs, what, whatever we can look through through societal threads to find out why this has happened, it is an issue. It is a problem. And I, I don't profess to have an answer, so I can't. I'm I'm not going to be the one who stands on the sidelines yelling like a Monday morning quarterback at the politicians on how to handle this because I don't know the exact answer. I mean, <clears throat> do do we institutionalize everyone? Do we? There's there was a there's a a writer that you and I are hoping to get in um, from LA Times who has written pretty consistently about the plight of the homeless. And he discovered a gentleman, and I really wanna get him on to talk to us about his experience. He discovered a gentleman who um, it turns out was classically trained pianist and began playing the piano and everyone would come around and gather around to hear this man who was so incredibly talented, magically talented. And he got, they got him all set up and he was going to live in an apartment and he fled the apartment because the confinement of it was far too much for his mental state. And so you think, oh, well, we'll just band-aid this with the normal answers for society, an apartment, a job, a clean haircut, new clothes, a manicure and a pedicure, uh, food and access to good food. I mean, excuse me, coupons and money to access to good food. Yeah. But the... The, the 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 answers lie where you and I are venturing on on this show in mental health and mental wellness and so we already know you and I do we've heard it said on the show a million times with people we've interviewed there we are woefully understaffed in social service and the the kids graduating from college aren't readily lining up to get into social work so what is the where what's the answer well what the answer is is what you're doing what we can do when you think globally but act locally you can you you do what you can and what you're doing putting on the gloves helping pick up not yelling at anybody understanding that it can be unnerving and and uncomfortable but you are doing what you can within your area i think this is the greatest step forward i think so it also relieves your anxiety about it when you start to do something instead yes. of around, you know, commiserating in your brain and overthinking things just to go and also a kind word once in a while to them. Really, you can see the difference it makes. I mean, there's you, I showed you a picture the other night. I showed you kind yes. of a screenshot of of um, uh, of what was going out uh, on outside the window. and. You know, you could be upset about it, but the the following morning I went down, I had my rubber gloves on and there was a pile of stuff somewhere. And I, I said to the guy, he was, he, they constantly are moving bottles. Like there's this clank of bottles going, you know, they're probably getting returns, money returns on, yes. on glass. Um, and I said, excuse me. I said, is, is this your stuff or can I throw it away? And he looked at me and he paused and he said, oh, 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 oh I'm so sorry. He said, I, I promised to get to that. And he did, you know, it was a couple hours later and it was very challenging for him to actually get it and take it and put it in, in the trash. It was, I could see that it was, it was difficult because he, he was struggling. He, he has, he has mental health problems, but just showing a moment of compassion and understanding and treating him like a human being. Like those were, those are possibly his possessions and they were, I guess. And saying, Hey, you know, are these yours? And what do you want me to do? Anyway, to your point, just, just to throw out some, some kindness, I think is the, the, the biggest thing that we can do. And instead of being angry, Yes, it is frustrating. Yes, you don't want them in your neighborhood, but you know, it's what happens. Anyway, I, I, I love this discussion. I'm sure it's a discussion we'll have again. Yep. Uh, don't go anywhere because next is my very good friend. Well, I want to say very good friend, Tom Verica, who is an extraordinary man. And you're going to hear your I former husband. Interview. What? It's your former husband. He is my former husband. Don't tell Bobby. It was on a show called Central Park West. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>
<laughs> Welcome back to Outcomes of Sun with Melissa Yamaguchi and myself, Marielle Hemingway. Oh, I'm so excited about our guest. Uh, his name is Tom Verica. I actually worked with him many years ago, and uh, he is he's had such an illustrious career since then. He's a gifted actor. He's a director and executive producer, but just on anything. It's something big and we all know about it. Currently, he is the head of creative production for Shondaland and Netflix. Uh, among his roles in creative leadership, Tom serves as an executive producer and director on three worldwide smash successes for Shondaland Netflix, including Queen Charlotte, of which Tom directed all the episodes, and they're so extraordinary, anyway, of the critically acclaimed series Bridgerton and Inventing Anna. Oh, yes, you are amazing. Tom was nominated for an, an Emmy Award for Outstanding Limited Series as an executive producer and a Director's Guild Award for Best Director of a Limited Series for Inventing Anna. He has been a longtime collaborator with Shonda Rhimes, and that includes his work as executive producer and director of Scandal and For the People. I'm so excited to welcome you to my show because I haven't seen you since I worked with you many years ago. And we <laughs> talk about that time uh, on a show that we really won't talk about either. Um, but it was so fun. And I, I feel giddy, like, like I'm, a, a, I don't know, like I'm meeting somebody from high school or something. That uh, I it was like, it felt, it feels like it was yesterday. And I'm, I'm extremely excited to see you and talk with you again. And, uh, yeah, we may forget uh, some of the uh, the dialogue and, and things we did on screen, but uh, off screen, we had a great time and it was such a pleasure working with you. Oh, totally. Well, you have, you know, you have really been at the helm of these incredible projects. I mean, truly incredible. Umbrella, uh, the Umbrella Academy, Grey's Anatomy, Boston Legal, Ugly Betty, and American Dreams. I mean, truly. And, and you're so prolific and you're so great. Like, I didn't know <laughs> then that you had so much in your, in your well of creativity and it, and it's so powerful that one of the reason, the reasons we wanted to talk to you is I, I watched Queen Charlotte and mm -hmm. I was just, I was just bowled over and I called Melissa. I said, you've got to watch this show. It's so powerful. It's powerful for me because, you know, a lot of what we talk about here on Outcomes of Sun is mental health. You know, yep. you know that I come from this family that's a little bit kooky. We're creative and we're amazing, but there is a lot of mental illness. And uh, we, uh, King George, you know, suffered from, you know, quote unquote madness. And I recognize that madness as being schizophrenic. He probably heard voices, whatever. I have a sister who uh, suffers from schizophrenia. She's still alive, whatever. She's under medication. You know, it wasn't back in the 1800s. So um, I just wanted to get your perspective on directing, you know, directing him. And, and you know, wh where's your head at when it comes to that part of the story? Well, it, it's uh, it's very important. And, and I had very early conversations with Shonda about handling this correctly, not sort of coming up with a diagnosis that we're putting on there. We wanted to honor a lot of the realities of what it was. Uh, and, you know, we very quickly pulled in a uh, historical advisor who knows everything about uh, George and Charlotte and particularly uh, about their relationship, but particularly about what um, some of the treatments George uh, King George had went through. So we did a deep dive into a lot of the um, <clears throat> documented. We had uh, we were privy to a lot of these lengthy logs about uh, days, literally a, a diary of days of what happened uh, after we cast Corey, who plays uh, young King George. <clears throat> we kind of went through a lot of the things and discussed kind of the mindset and what was happening in the relationship. Um, and all along, Shonda wanted to make sure that we were <clears throat> staying true to kind of what it was. I mean, there are a lot of things about the show that is historically accurate. We did take some license, obviously, because it is a love story ultimately, and that's that's what we leaned into. Um, but our approach to 
uh, to mental health and the treatment of um, of how King George was and how it fed our story and finding the crossroads of that was very important to us. The character that we've created of, of John, Dr. John Monroe is kind of an amalgamation of a, a few different doctors. There was uh, Dr. Francis Willis, who was probably the most uh, known doctor who treated him at the time. Uh, and and a, a lot of different methods that they used in doing that. And it escalated into some very um, troubling physical things. Um, yeah. But at the heart of it, which is, I, I think, what we come away with on our show is that it really is the uh, their love for one another and her commitment to him and standing by him that uh, that really rings true. And that was the emotional element that we we really wanted to get into and then pepper in some of those, you know, the pure elements of what Dr. Monroe originally set out to do and how we wanted to deal with those things and how successful some of those things were. And yeah. then obviously it escalated um, and, and and everything was kind of, they pulled him away from the queen and dealt with him uh, separately. So, yeah, so it kind of fed into a, a lot of those things did happen, you know, the ice baths, the 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 bloodletting, and, and uh, there, there were a number of pretty barbaric uh, methods in trying to to shake that out. You know, there was one element that we wanted to, we did not want to do, which uh, was frequently done with him in his later stages of that, which was uh, what we know as a straitjacket. I think it was called a, um, I think it was called a waistcoat, I believe they call it. But oftentimes um, they, he would go to bed, they would tie him to bed and he would sleep in that and he could, he couldn't get out. And it was really just uh, that, that we, we did have uh, lines that we did want to draw and, and did not want to portray certain things, but enough yeah. people can do their research, you know. Well, what, you know, and and you're right. It really was, and it's a surprise. What I love about Queen Charlotte is that you suspect that maybe she's disgusted with him in the beginning, no. in the beginning mm -hmm. of the of the end of of Queen Charlotte when she's older, kind right. of looking back, is he dead? But then what you realize is this unveiling of this deep love that they had for one another, and. I mean, it actually brings tears to my eyes because she loved him so much and he loved her. I mean, it was, it, it, it's really beautifully, beautifully done. And, and getting back to the doctor, because mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Some of the things in the very beginning, when he looks at him and he says, come on, yeah. you know, like mm -hmm. be with me here, you can do this, whatever. There were many things that he did and maybe it's been the ice baths. We won't go into the other thing. <laughs> like, right, yeah. you know, like but some of that i'm sure all the crossfit people were like yes <laughs> right yeah uh, yeah well no but they were they were effective and 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 look i i think and, and you know we are fortunate enough in this in today's society to look at other methods that are much more uh humane and and really can reach people if, if with just a little bit of care and concern and connection because that can that can break i'm not saying you know i'm not getting into uh, uh, people's methods and what they do. But I think what we touched upon there is, you know, he really took a path of really trying to connect and look into him and, and, and steer and, and guide him with, uh, with that emotional connection. And that's was kind of sobering in our story to George and that kind of, it, it kind of took him out of that and then gave him a sense of peace. And I think once you, you know, in, in a lot of the research we had, once that nervous system calms a bit, uh, a lot of that can take root, you know. Yeah, and and the fact that Queen Charlotte, and I'm going to let you talk, Melissa. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but the fact that Queen Charlotte um, really would meet him where he was, and then yeah. kind of, you know, they would meet under the bed, and then slowly they'd come out of this. He'd come out of kind of the bubble of 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 fantasy, or you know, living in his in his other world, and kind yeah. of come get grounded and come back come come back down and they were together i mean it's just powerful stuff well and i think that's it really is the power it really is the power of shonda's writing about how she she uh -huh. we put back those layers because we first meet them he's clearly holding on to something you see a little bit in the first episode you see a little bit of of that but we talk very specifically with our young actors uh, about protection and him him really wanting to protect her and and it's such a beautiful thing, uh, but it comes out in such a harsh way. So the audience 
suspects something's up. And as we kind of discover, and you know, people who know about him obviously know where he ended up, but we had a little bit of, uh, we didn't get to do as deep a dive in the first two seasons of Bridgerton, even though we had, there's probably three scenes total with the older George and Charlotte of when he's having these episodes and breaking out and how it's impacting um, Golda, who plays older, older Charlotte. And she just beautifully found these levels that were not in the script uh, about the, the, the pain that she was feeling for him uh, and for, and for them, but, but was loyal even after, you know, what we now have come to know, they had 15 kids and a great love affair, you know. Amazing. You have, there's, there's, there's an opening, I think, of dialogue that you've afforded your audience. And there's in two, two incidences that are two situations that I think stood out the most for me. One is where you have the mother asking, are there any signs when George mm. and Charlotte have had their baby? And he's like, what do you mean, mother? And so it's, it's that, it's that the unspoken that a lot of family members of someone who has a mental illness are wondering, are they, are, is there, are they normal? Are they enough? Are they okay? Have they taken their meds? Are they, are they good enough today? Is today okay? So mm -hmm. you, that's an opening. And, and even though it, it can be seen by the, by Charlotte, the young Charlotte, who's in love as the, the mother-in-law, the ubiquitous mother-in-law is being cruel to George in her mind. She was protecting him. Like, is he okay? I've got to keep him. Okay. So they don't come in and take him from the court. So there's mm -hmm. that conversation that is so real for so many people who love someone with mental illness, but then you juxtapose it with this, this love, this cure of love, if you will of yeah. Charlotte, where yeah. she's under the bed with him at their old age that Mary was referring to, where she says to him, part farmer, part king, just George, that he, he, that this, this madness, this diagnosis, if you will, was an appendage of who he was. And I think the way that this was handled was so healthy for those who are, are living in this every day to day, you opened up a dialogue for of conversation so i really want to applaud how this was handled it was done so beautifully and masterfully i'm really grateful that meryl asked me to get well she didn't ask she demanded that i watch it <laughs> and i complied so thank you for well, that I'm glad. I thank you for I, I thank you for saying that it is it really is that human element that um again these actors you know she has to find a way to connect with him and, and again we're seeing them now in these older uh in this older age and and you know, basically the life in our world as we've, as we've come to know them is they live separate lives as they often did uh, back then. Um, but, you know, she has some, she's coming in with some really exciting news and wants to share that about one of their children. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's what's so good is she finds a way to, to, to meet him where he's at so that they can connect. Uh, and that's what uh, I, I, you know, when Shonda first told me, I was just, uh, about them being under the bed. I mean, first as a director, I'm like, how the hell am I going to technically do this? <laughs> <laughs> but I was, it didn't, you know, I was still caught up in the emotion and what that moment was. And I, I, you know, it was, it brought tears to all our eyes when we first read the script and, you know, in the, in the, um, in, in the script that didn't have it, they weren't, we weren't intercutting. I, I, I came up with that a few weeks before we shot it. Uh, I, I got the young actors to learn it because I wanted, I really wanted to get into the headspace of each of those, the older George and Charlotte, so that when they look at that person, they still see that person that yeah. they've always been. And yeah. that's really effective how they came across. across. And, uh, you know, you were saying about, uh, we had those discussions, um, the actress who plays uh, uh, Lady Dowager, uh, Michelle Fairley, who she was kind of struggling a bit when uh, about saying that line is, is, do you see anything? Is there anything wrong? And she, she, you know, she intellectually is like, well, you wouldn't really see anything in a baby that young, but, I, but what we obviously tap into is just, it's the fear. Uh, yes. And it's, it's her own fear of what, uh, of wanting to protect, protect him at all costs, protect her emotions, everything. So it's not that there was anything physically that you would recognize, but it's just that wanting to hold on to because she has fought so long to hold on to protecting her son. You know? Well, I know I, I know what that feeling is when you have a heritage of that yeah. in your family. You do worry about it. I mean, sure. I know when I looked at my babies. I, I, you know, I just I could only pray that they wouldn't suffer 
or something, you know, but then I got, but it also propels you to find solutions, you know, for, I don't know, for, it, it, in the, in, in my world, it was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be the person that says no to this moving it forward. Like we're going to find a lifestyle that enhances your ability to t- take control of your brain, but that's mm-hmm. a whole other thing. You know, Corey is, well, they're both amazing actors. The young actors are so, they're beautiful. And they take on the sophistication of the time Mm -hmm. and of the story that really is not easy to do at their, I I think at their age and also not have, I mean, they really, you must have really helped them to understand that the world that they were coming into was a far more um, kind of, sophisticated world in a way. I mean, yes, we have more knowledge now, but the, it was an elegant world. It's a different kind of world. And what I love about being able to explore these um, these these things like mental illness in that time is that you don't have technology. You don't have things that you can rely on. You have to rely on really unspoken things. And I think you as a director really helped them to find those unspoken moments. You know, it really, and you know this probably better than I do, you know, as an, as an actor and a director that it's really not, it's, it's less in the words, it's between the words sometimes. Yeah. And it was, you you really tapped upon it because they, they are, they're young actors. Uh, They're both, both young and and, uh, India has done a few things. Corey, it's only his, second job he's ever done and he had one line and something wow. else so there was a bit of a chance but it, it's the risk that we wanted to take because we really wanted the audience to take this journey with someone who they didn't know from something else um we he had uh an unpredictability that in his audition that i just really tapped into and in their chemistry read i kind of gave them kind of flushed them out a little bit and gave them a couple things to see how they would adjust to it and if they could hear and even whether it was right or wrong to see if they'd be able to sort of switch gears like that and then we had um we did have a rehearsal process where we really kind of worked through that relationship we had uh you know we had someone uh, what's great about this world you have we have an etiquette person who comes in and teaches them all about etiquette so they they possess in their quality what they bring as actors so beautifully is uh they do bring in uh something to the table with with their their elegance and their maturity to a degree but there's still a lot of things that are unknown just for the sheer fact of how old they are that they have not lived so i think we were very lucky and 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 you know mario you gotta you got all these elements have to come together and you hope you you hit it, you know, you hit it where people respond to it. But um, in, in this case, they they really they they took it and they soared. And we really explored. You know, there was one sequence where George is is waiting for her, and it's the nerves of that moment that he his mind starts to wander. And we played a lot with the silence of that. That scene was originally on on the page. He, he had a moment, and then she walks in. But I said, I want to, I want to. I want to explore this bit more if you'll go with me. And he he was such a, you know, he really dove in as far as reading a lot of these logs and really wanting to understand and play it. And uh, so he really, we played with the handshake and we did some tests of that uh, and really kind of went through the psych- psychology of, of his slowly uh, slipping and how that affects him emotionally and physically uh, before, um, Reynolds comes over and puts a hand on him. And once he feels that hand of someone who he's known all his life, it just grounds him and centers him before she ends. So those are things that are so beautiful to play as a director, to have the actors explore that because it is, as you were saying, Melissa, it's, it's, it's that exploration of, of what is, what is, what are they going through? How are they taking that journey with just the visual and not sort of telling you, Oh, this is what you're feeling. This is what you're, um and it was you know when i turned in my director's cut uh shonda i don't think touched anything in that she thought it was just so you were just in get you were just completely on board with him the whole way uh and and just caught up in what he was going through in the and the prison that he was living in but then the the calmness of of what happens and how he, he centers himself to get get back to where he needs to be for her for her entrance and uh 
yeah, it was quite it was quite exciting to watch and, and certainly to play. Bad. Well, yeah, I mean, for I'll say that leads me to wonder, are we gonna have a second season? <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the answer to that. Um I really don't. I, I really hope. Uh, I, I It's been one of the most rewarding experiences, I think, having directed all six of them, which was daunting initially, but something I've always wanted to tackle. But I, it gave me such ownership of uh, the totality of the show and 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 the, all these mini arcs and the larger arcs. Uh, I, I, it was and with this cast, it was really one of the most exhilarating experiences. So I did. I definitely want another one. I could think of a couple. A couple of areas which I've dropped hints Stop to Shonda. Not I will. She needs it. <laughs> I'll vote for it. I promise. I'm in. <laughs> I tell whoever needs to be told that there needs to be another episode. The other thing that you did so beautifully, and you really talked about it, is that the fact that you know it's always perception, right? One character has a perception, and that's what you see it from. And then you know, and then in another episode, you get the same story from from a different a different actor's perception or a different you know character's perception and 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 then you create this whole world and and you really did take such be i mean i really felt your creativity just like like unfold in this whole process i mean it was really it was really beautifully beautifully done you should be and i'm sure you are so proud of it cuz i I'm, I'm proud of you Thank you. I, I I am very proud of this this project. I, I for all the reasons that you're saying. I think it, uh, you know, the the benefit of having uh, her point of view in the first episode, and then revisiting everything in the fourth one, where we're going back to those same moments and just moments before, moments after, uh, was really just a gift for for uh, a visual storyteller to be able to have have those things and how you can sort of lead the audience and take them down the path. Uh, of what's what that character is going through so thank you very much Mary I appreciate you saying that <laughs> well it's easy it's not I mean because you look at it and I want every everybody who's listening I, you got to watch this show because it's not easy to take simply one section of life that's you know you're not going off to war you're not going here you're not you're in one place really you know there's one location maybe two locations within a location that you're dealing with and it's you're dealing it with it emotionally so you have to make that rich each time each each it's like each frame has to be filled with things to keep your attention because you're only dealing with really one concept but you're dealing yep. with it from different perspectives so it's it, it's powerful. powerful well it's a much more i think different than bridgerton bridgerton kind of uh captures a wider swath and a lot of different stories this really takes a more personal uh and, and deeper dive into the the you know the fabric of this relationship and and the you know and where they go to and and you know we give a lot of it a little bit of the current day bridgerton stuff but it really is um it takes a definitely a, a different journey and and I highly recommend if you haven't seen it to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. To, I think it's hard to navigate. You've got the court. There's there was no privacy back then. There's no yeah, privacy. No. I mean, there there's there's no indoor plumbing. So the fact that yeah. you were able to capture sophistication within without indoor plumbing time when there's no indoor plumbing and people are trying to keep a highbrow. And then you've got the total lack of privacy. So whatever George or anybody at the time was suffering from was really open fodder for everyone to to take a dig at or and which it goes back to explain the queen dowagers desperate yeah. need to keep him protected but i love the i and forgive me since i'm not from this in from the industry i i just love the almost the mental break you gave the audience by bringing in other stories that mm -hmm. were we were needed it Yes, because it, it it could have been a lot. It was there were intense scenes that I was on the edge of my seat, really paying attention to, not only for the show, but because it was so encap so encaptured or enraptured, excuse me. But the the break in it allowed some that. But then we, it brings us back to um, George never got a break from yeah. who he was, uh, except for the treatment. I know that that was supposed to have been a break, but I. I the handling of this was so 
amazing. And you did say that you brought in experts for this. You, it, it clearly shows. It shows that this was handled with such finesse. So, well, and also, I mean, to your point, the 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 one area we try to give, uh, which uh, one of our historians mentioned it, and Shonda heard it and took it and ran with it, which I loved was that he was really into farming and he loved farming and farmer George, he came up with obviously with farmer George, uh, but he, uh, that was his place of, I think that was his little, his little place of peace uh, it was farming. And he did uh, spend quite a bit of time out in the fields. And I think that physical, uh, the physical work and, 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 and just kind of people's um, expectation of a King would not have been that. So I think it was really, a, a personal need for him to do that. And maybe in, in some way that was part of his, his uh, speaking out of, of needing to be kind of either out in nature or just, you know, the sun is sweating, whatever, just to be, right. uh, shake up uh, the, you know, the imprisonment of, of, of inside. Well, you know, these... uh, the movement, yeah. my knowledge about mental health is that really all of those kind of natural th connecting in nature, getting sun, he didn't even know that. And that's real. It's so beautiful because, you know, human nature, we're so drawn to what we actually need, you know, in some ways, uh, except that I, I do have a question. Historically, did he did he become more and more like disoriented as time yeah, went on. Yeah, it, it as time went on it got worse. Um, you know, in 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 reality, I think it happens a little bit. It doesn't happen quite uh, at this there was an episode when he was a kid, I believe, uh, but nothing that they were uh, really concerned about, but it started taking off after they started having children uh a couple of years, I think probably 5 or 6 years after their marriage. Uh and there were they were small episodes and it got bigger. Of course, there was no official diagnosis at that time there was a lot of they were throwing a lot of uh, theories out there and and um uh, and hopefully you know right practices to hopefully uh, but i think there was probably there was in some of the research we had that the it would have been uh analogous to bipolar and i think it did sort of accelerate uh, as it got later and and um yeah you know there was a beautiful beautiful moment i'll share this real quick uh we were at kew gardens which is where he um Charlotte spent most of her time in a late in her later years. She actually died before him. Uh, oh. And um, he uh, when he died, um, there was uh, she was sitting. Uh, she wanted to, she she didn't want to die. Oh, gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, she didn't she didn't want to. She heard his uh, the carriage that was carrying his casket go by her window. And she didn't move from her chair because, but her biggest fear is that she never wanted to be, to go before him. I'm sorry. I am messing this up. She, she died before him. Five minutes. I see that. Uh, she died before him. And uh, he heard people documented. He heard her carriage go by and felt her, even though he was not really clear and articulate in what he was able to say, but he heard her carriage go by and he evidently got very emotional at that, and that kind of hit him. That was so so profound for us to hear this historian who knew all these details about that, uh, and pretty powerful stuff that you know and, that we couldn't put in there, but really kind of colors the relationship and oh, yeah. really what he felt, even even though he was not in his mental state, uh, his mental, his ability to sort of really process, he felt it, and that was uh, that's pretty powerful. Well, that solidified the love story that you encapsulated throughout the show. There, well, they, that, and that's what kind of insinuated, and that's what Shonda kind of worked worked ways to sort of factor exactly that connection in there. Oh, it's great. It's great. Well, we don't have much time, but I do want to get it. I mean, you work with Shonda Rhimes. That's got to be pretty extraordinary for you. Uh, you know, I think you're probably really good friends because you've been working together for years. Yes. Yeah. We've been working together for about, uh, about 16 years now. I think I, I came in by accident. Someone had dropped out of an episode of Grey's Anatomy and I stepped in and that, that was how we met. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's slow. It's just been building and building. And we, I think we just have a shorthand, her writing and how I shoot her stuff. I think we just really clicked and, uh, yeah, I'm very, very blessed to work with her because I think she's enormously talented and very smart. And uh, yeah, I mean, as evidenced by yeah, what she it, it, clearly, you have a deep uh, respect for one another. I, I mean, I hope that maybe you would come back and really kind of talk about your career and all the different things that you've done because really, what you've done is, it, it, I, you know, I listed it in the beginning, but 
if people, being in the business, I know how hard it is to get all those pieces working. And I, I watched you on uh, how to get away with murder, <laughs> which was so much fun just watching you act, but be a part of that, you know, like you've got some, you really have an amazing. Yeah, I've been career. very lucky. It's taken a lot of turns and twists, but uh, you know, those, those creative I think I'm going one way and I don't want to do this, but something presents itself and I and and, <laughs> drops. and my wife says, you're an idiot. You have to take that road. So, <laughs> so I have, I have her, to, uh, her to thank for a lot of that. But no, I've been very, very lucky and, and uh, to to be able to creatively play in a couple of different sandboxes. So I'd be happy to come back. Oh, awesome. Well, to my former husband in a show, uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Tom. I truly, we are, we are so blessed to have had you here. You're in London, which is kind of cool. And uh, we're very excited to have had you on the show. And I really do look forward to having you back. Thank you, everyone. You're listening to Outcomes of Sun Radio with my host, Melissa Yamaguchi. And don't leave because she's going to come back with an energy tip. Welcome back to Outcomes the Sun. I'm Melissa Yamaguchi with Mariel Hemingway, and I'm here to give you a tip on energy. I want to talk about how feng shui aids in the quest for mental health. So I'm giving you tips through every week, every day about what, ment what feng shui can do and how you orchestrate it to navigate through your life with ease. And I want to highlight specifically how feng shui helps with mental health. First and foremost, Removing clutter from your home frees your mind. If you, every time you walk into your office space or your kitchen space or wherever, and you see a table or desk piled with clutter of things, it can stagnate the mind. So it stops you from being able to think clearly when there's constant piles. Now, I have worked with people who said, oh, no, no, I need all these cl clusters of things on my desk. That's where I find, I find peace. Don't touch it. I know where everything is. <clears throat> Well, when you when those clutters force you to then rifle through the, the paper for an extra five to 10 minutes, putting you behind, that can cause some stress. So it's not that everyone has to use the Dewey Decimal System for their desk to keep it in order, but having does free the mind. The second thing is we know in feng shui, we bring in a lot of nature. We bring in plants and plants are used throughout the home or the office space to create good feng shui because of the oxygen and, and also because it's a living thing around you and the greenery is so beautiful or the color of the flower. But nature heals and we know that it heals. So there it's, it's aiding in your mental health, the nature around, the plants around you. The third thing I wanna highlight is that when we talk about the feng shui of the bedroom, when you have taken measures to ensure that your bedroom is, is technically correct feng shui, low to no tech, the proper sheets, the proper shade so that you can get enough rest, the proper temperature so that you can sleep effectively, that this all aids in your mental health. This feng shui move of ensuring that your bedroom is your haven aids in your mental health. Because you've heard Mariel talk ad nauseum about the, the effects of good sleep for your mental health. So that's a feng shui tip there. The next thing I want to share with you is that when you take control of your environment, which feng shui encourages you to do, you then by essence are taking control of your life. The more control you feel over your own life, the more empowered you are. When things are out of control and chaotic and it feels as if someone else is pulling the strings of your puppet, you feel stressed, anxious, and nervous. And so when you can gain some control over your haven, your home, your refuge, this can quell, can help and aid in calming the mind. So feng shui for your mental health. That's my tip. Please stay tuned. Upcoming next for Health and Balance is Mariel Hemingway. You're listening to Out Comes the Sun. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Marielle Hemingway with my co-host, Melissa Yamaguchi on Outcomes of Sound Radio. And I'm back with a tip on balance. So I just want to talk about why regular exercise really helps your brain. Uh, you know, I know I talk about all these different things, but today I just want to focus on exercise and, and why it's so important. I, I know for me, my whole 
my whole history as a young teenager, as a, a even as an elementary school kid, I remember that if I didn't go outside and move my body, I just didn't feel right. Yes, I I had kind of a disruptive home and there was chaos going on. And but it was that connecting in nature and moving my body that really helped my brain. I mean, it improved self-confidence. And regardless of weight, size, gender, or age, exercise quickly elevates a person's perception of their attractiveness, right? It just makes you feel better about yourself, that you look better, right? That's And that's good for your brain. Um, it also prevents cognitive decline. Okay, this is, this is huge. People need to realize that Movement is not just for the body, it's for the brain, you know, and, and as we age, we need to move more. Movement is really so, such an enormous part of the solution of, of, of lessening cognitive decline. It's just, it's huge. It's a huge, huge, huge thing. It also alleviates anxiety. You know, we all suffer from anxiety probably to a certain degree because of our jobs, because of the stress levels of whatever it is, raising kids, our jobs, you know, the fact that we live in a very challenging world right now, you know, mortgage payments, what, whatever it is that you're anxious about, go outside, move your body, move, walk, run ride a bike, do whatever you need to do to alleviate some of that anxiety. And also it boosts your brain power. When you move your body, your brain starts firing better, right? You, you just are better in, in your brain when you, you move, especially cardiovascular exercise. It can create new brain cells and improve overall brain performance. Um, and it sharpens your memory. So any of you out there wondering, wait, I forgot this and realize that you're forgetting a lot of things. Again, part of the solution is get outside, get moving, or maybe it's not outside, but move your body. It is incredibly, incredibly important. So I just, I just have to say, you know, exercise for me has been a, a, a it's, it's a, it's life-changing for me. I mean, I, I've, I've done it since I was a kid and I'm just inviting everyone. I don't care if you can't move well, move, move your body. It's important for your brain. And on that note, <laughs> hey, you got to move that body, move that body, make sure you body. don't hurt nobody. I, I want to share some pretty exciting news, Melissa. I think you you have this information. Uh, cool. So everybody who listens to us, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, we are sharing that we, in the last, gosh, what is this? The last seven days, we've had 2,861 plays of our show in the United States. We have had 1,452 in Los Angeles. Well, number one in Los Angeles. I know it's awesome. I and, love LA. <laughs> and 1,121 in Santa Barbara. We love you, Santa Barbara. You are our people. Gotcha. Uh, 29 in your neighborhood, Melissa. Well, <laughs> listen, I, the, the list goes on. How, how exciting is this? We, Council Bluffs and Eugene, Oregon, but how about this? North Hollywood, Frankfurt, Germany. Here's, here's one that I'm going to get really excited about. Spain? My daughter lives in Spain. I maybe love all, maybe it's maybe maybe I need to acknowledge her. It could be all of her friends. How about how about someone one of your stomping grounds from when you were a kid, France? Oh my gosh. Totally. Merci, gracias. And Canada is listening. Brazil. Oh, Canada. Okay. Brazil. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Ah, uh, yeah, listening to us. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We're so grateful for all of these amazing people that are tuning into the show. We couldn't be more excited about it. And thank you, as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing up for Outcomes of Sun. And always remember that our whole the whole idea behind behind doing our radio show is to highlight the Mariel Hemingway Foundation.org. 
And I just want to remind you that it's M-A-R-I-E-L-H-E-M-I-N-G-W-A-Y.org. And the reason why I say that is sometimes people put an extra well, in that Hemingway. So don't put an extra M in and go to the go to the foundation site so that you can help us become a resource navigator so that we can find solutions for everybody in their mental health struggles, no matter where you are in the country. So thank you all so much for listening. And uh, bye from Melissa Yamaguchi. Goodbye. So long. We need to start speaking the other languages. Yes. A feed is in goodbye. In Germany, <laughs> India, we're, we're coming. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Out Comes the Sun has been a production of Evolve Entertainment. Hosts, Mariel Hemingway and Melissa Yamaguchi. Executive producer, Jeremiah Higgins. And sound engineer and producer, Richard Dr. D. Dugan. Thank you for listening.